Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad, and I just watched the second official trailer of Spider-Man No Way Home at 0.2 Fabric speed, and it was absolutely bonkers. Now I took my time to pinpoint each and every detail in the trailer, so I'm gonna make sure this video is worth your time. I'm gonna be breaking down frame by frame, so I might spoil a lot of the movie for you. So if you want a clean experience in the theater, I'd suggest you click away right now. Now without any further ado, let's just jump into it. So the trailer opens with the shot of Tom Holland where he looks devastated, and even though it's raining, it's quite clear that Tom's Peter is crying here. I think this tragic scene takes place right after Aunt May gets killed by Green Goblin. That's right, according to multiple reports, Peter will lose Aunt May in this film. The look on Peter's face totally indicates that he lost someone close to him. And it has to be Aunt May, because that way the MCU will have its own version of Uncle Ben. Tom's Peter then says ever since he got bit by the spider, he only spent one week where everything felt normal. And that was when he revealed his true identity to MJ. I am Spider-Man. You're, you're being serious right now? Mm -hmm. Now while he says that, we get visuals that we've seen already in the previous trailer. They fly past this picture of Peter, which is half him and half Spider-Man. This is directly taken from the comics. We then see them getting surrounded by the police, which again we've seen in the previous trailer. However, this time there's a little bit more to it. We now see Peter and MJ jumping off and escaping through a subway tunnel. So this is pretty much the beginning of the film where Peter is on the run with MJ. Peter then goes to the Sanctum Sanctorum seeking Doctor Strange's help. But notice they have made a couple of changes to the Sanctum and around the sanctum. They got rid of this extra sunlight from the previous trailer and added a few birds in the sky in order to make everything much more realistic. Sony even made changes to the next shot where Peter stands at the door. For instance, in the first trailer, the tree behind Peter was green and there weren't many leaves on the road, so it was very likely during summer. But now in the second trailer, it has been changed to fall season. Therefore, the tree looks yellowish and there are now a lot more leaves beside the sidewalk. And even the building in the background has been color graded differently this time. Now, if you're wondering why such a difference, well, it's usual for studios to keep making VFX changes to match the background better to the plot of the film. And they usually keep making such changes even two weeks before release. Then we see Doctor Strange telling Peter Parker that because they botched this spell, where they tried to make everyone forget Peter is Spider-Man, it opened the gate for some unwanted visitors. Now Strange, of course, is talking about Green Goblin, Doctor Octopus, Sandman, Electro, and Lizard over here. And notice when Doctor Strange was saying this to Peter, Peter is wearing a suit. But in a close-up shot, he's wearing a jacket with a t-shirt underneath. So this is again Sony being cheeky with their editing to throw off the audience. So what I think is happening here is Peter wears this regular outfit at the beginning of the film where the spell goes wrong. But after the bridge fight, Peter shows up again at the sanctum wearing this formal suit. And over there, he gets attacked by Lizard, who was imprisoned by Doctor Strange. So all of this confuses Peter, and that's when Doctor Strange explains to him the ramification of their spell going wrong. But Sony, being extremely clever, has actually put these two scenes together and made it look like it's one scene. You notice how Doctor Strange looks wary and a bit out of place here. It's because after Peter got attacked by Lizard, Lizard, Doctor Strange probably came to his rescue and put Lizard in his cell again. That's why the Doctor looks a bit strange here. We then see the spell going wrong and there are multiple mystical rings around them. Now keep this in mind, I'll talk about it at the end. But this time we hear the iconic evil laugh of Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin without the background music. We then get our first ever official look at MCU's Green Goblin hovering on his green and purple glider. This is probably the shot that was made into a PNG and put into every f***ing poster of the movie. Notice Green Goblin is still wearing his helmet along with his classic suit from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1. Now according to multiple scoops, when Green Goblin gets sucked into the MCU, he will be wearing the exact same suit as he did in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1. But his suit will get damaged at the end and he will lose his helmet. As a result, he will borrow the black goggles from Dr. Octopus, which I'll talk about in a moment. We then see Tom Spider-Man fighting Electro for the first time in the MCU at a power station. But we don't really see Electro just yet. This is probably where Peter will come across Electro for the first time in the film. And notice how Marvel added those red and yellow leaves on the ground to show us the impact of Electro's lightning bolt. Without these leaves flying, Electro's lightning bolt may not look that good. This is the reason Marvel switched from summer season to fall season. Now Peter here of course is donning the black and gold suit. To be honest, I love this, simply because this is Peter's same old black and red suit but turned into inside out. Because at one point in the film, one of Mysterio's supporters throws green paint at Tom Spider-Man in the street. This will cause Peter to flip his suit inside out, therefore showing us all the electrical circuits that we wouldn't see otherwise. Now in Spider-Man Homecoming, when Peter removed the tracker from his suit that Tony Stark made for him, there we could clearly see that the inside of his suit was black and golden. You notice Peter still doesn't have any claw marks on his suit, the marks that we've seen him have at the Feast facility in trailer 1. That means as of this scene, Peter is yet to fight Lizard. And this 
is the exact same location where Sandman will appear as well. Cut to the bridge once again where we now see Dr. Octopus fighting Tom Spider-Man. Now if I slow down the speed and zoom in, you can actually notice that Peter webs up one of Doc Ock's tentacles to this car door. But his attempt goes in vain as Doc Ock literally breaks off the door of the car. It happens so fast, if you don't slow down the playback, you will miss a lot of the efforts that Tom Spider-Man makes to stop Dr. Octopus. Now this scene is one of my favorites from the trailer. And again, if you don't slow it down, you'll miss a lot of the action. For example, this angry face of Dr. Octopus, which we see for less than a second. Here he has Peter upside down by the wall, but let me just rotate the footage so I can explain it better. Notice how Peter is missing some of the nanoparticles around his chest and right above his stomach. This is because some moments earlier, Dr. Octopus actually absorbed the nanoparticles from the Iron Spider suit, specifically from his chest plate. Now let me play a part from my previous breakdown where I actually predicted this. Notice the way Doc Ock is attacking Peter here. He has one of his tentacles preventing Peter from moving his head. Another one wrapped around him, preventing him from using his webs. But notice this particular arm over here. It looks like it is trying to dismantle Peter's iron spider suit. I mean, why else would it be attacking the chest specifically? So this confirms I was right. Doc Ock is attacking Peter's chest here for some very specific reasons. And here's why this is one of my favorite details in the whole trailer. Notice how Peter realizes that Doc Ock is again going for his chest, which is now unguarded. So he didn't care about revealing his face and just decided to transfer the nanotech from his mask to fill the void and guard his body instead. This shows just how advanced Peter's iron spider suit is and how quick of a thinker Peter is himself. Now seeing Tom's Peter without his mask, Dr. Octopus says you're not Peter Parker. This one simple line of dialogue basically confirms Tobey Maguire is in it. Why would you have a villain acknowledge that his version of Peter Parker looks different if you have no intention of showing him? So this one line essentially confirms Tobey's appearance. Then we see Peter dodging a car thrown by Dr. Octopus. Now if anyone knows John Watts, the director of the film, he loves putting easter eggs in license plates. This one here reads ASM8183 or Amazing Spider-Man August 1st, 1983. This issue is all about Peter Parker having options and what he decides for his future. This kind of makes sense as he's really going to be put through the ringer in this movie and will have to think about his future without his loved ones by the end of the film. Peter, MJ and Ned are then seen inside the Sanctum's basement where Doctor Strange has all the villains locked up. They all have a funny exchange between themselves but notice how Peter and MJ are looking at Doctor Octavius but Ned is totally looking somewhere else. And I really think Doctor Octavius isn't alone here in this basement. He has other villains locked up beside him and that's probably where Ned is looking. And he's even carrying a crossbow on his hands, so yes. I think when they came to this basement and were greeted by the locked up villains, they got scared and as a result, Ned took this bow on his hands. And notice how Doc Ock just simply stood there where he could have easily walked forward and came out of this cell, but he didn't even try. And notice in this close-up shot, we can actually see some sort of a gray magical barrier that is not letting him escape from here. So even though it may not look like a regular prison cell, Doctor Strange used magic to make sure it works like one. Then the camera pans over the New York City skyline and we can see that the Statue of Liberty is being remodeled to honor Captain America. We can spot a giant shield at the top and the poster showing us that it's supposed to look as though Lady Liberty is holding the shield. Now I think this is one of the best locations where you can have your final act. Captain America aka Steve Rogers, a man out of time, who became the man of all time, stood his ground against thousands and never gave up. He deserves a tribute like this. And I can't wait to see how it looks once the work is done. Oh for f**k's sake. Anyway, notice the lighting around the shield that is still being built. Makes it look exactly like the actual shield. The colors blue, red, and white are all visible. Now, Doctor Strange says there were other villains out there and we need to send them back where they came from. And here we get another look at Peter's black and gold suit, which is now enchanted by magical powers on his right arm. So at some point in the movie, Doctor Strange is gonna lend some of his abilities to Peter Parker because he's gonna need it if he's gonna fight 1v6. Now there's a very interesting detail here. Notice how Peter literally duct taped a cell phone on his chest and on the screen we can see MJ and Ned. If you take an even closer look, you'll see that Ned and MJ are actually moving on the screen, indicating they may be on a video call communicating with Peter. And I would even go as far as saying that this cell phone being here is not something new. Perhaps we will learn in the movie that Peter always used to duct tape his cell phone inside his suit, but it being inside out, we can now see it. Now behind Spider-Man we can see Electro charging up, even though the lightning of his body looks blue, but his lightning bolts are yellow. So if Marvel and Sony pay attention to continuity, 
which I think they will. So they simply cannot change Electra from blue to yellow. They would probably write a scene where Electra goes through some kind of a transformation that turns him into this from this. Cut to the Sanctum, where Doctor Strange tells Peter, Ned, and MJ to get their shit together. We are then told the reason why all these villains are all of a sudden trying to kill Tom's Peter. Doctor Strange says, and I quote, they all die fighting Spider-Man. It's their fate. So this pretty much confirms my theory that all these villains are being reluctant to go back to their universes. Because if they do go back, their version of Spider-Man will eventually kill them. This guilt trips Tom's Peter, as he would never kill any human as Spider-Man. So he decides to free the Sinister Six from Strange's prison. And that's why he steals this magical box from the Sanctum that holds the key to free or enslave these villains. But Strange has to send them back to their universes to keep the timelines in order. And this is what creates the conflict between Strange and Parker, which results in this epic chase inside the Mirror Dimension. We then get our first look at J. Jonah Jameson since his appearance in Far From Home. And it seems like he now works directly in the field as well. Instead of just reading reports of the teleprompter, he now does something that requires more courage. He's obviously looking at Electro here as the previous scene gives it away. But notice he has a cameraman always focusing on him and recording him. Now in the next shot, we get a proper look at MCU's Sandman. And if I had to make out of what's happening here, they're probably trying to intimidate the general public by flying across the city. Now this shot has incredible attention to detail. As Spider-Man flies and kicks Dr. Octopus, he does a flip and makes a smooth landing. But notice when he was about to throw the flying kick, all four of his mechanical legs were activated. But as Spider-Man had to fly through this narrow space, his mechanical legs automatically shrink down. And as soon as the path is clear, it goes back to its original size again. Let's the VFX team deserves an applause for this sort of work. We then see Peter wearing his integrated suit, jumping after a pumpkin bomb, and I can only assume this is taking place inside the Feast facility. According to multiple reports, after this bridge fight, Green Goblin, aka Norman Osborn, will disguise himself as a homeless person and take shelter in this Feast facility which is run by Aunt May. After Goblin manipulates Tom's Peter into doing what he wants, he will then head straight to Peter's aunt and kill her. This won't be the first time Goblin does this. Back in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1, he chose to attack Aunt May as well and set up Peter Parker. This extreme lack of morality is what makes him such a dangerous villain. Now the reason I think this is happening inside a Feast facility is because Peter is not wearing any mask. Whenever he fights in an environment where everybody knows him, he ditches the mask. But in the final battle, which does take place in public, there he keeps the mask on as much as he can. Now while Peter fails to stop the pumpkin bomb from going off, outside this building a car explodes. And here I found some significant details that will tell us a lot about the plot of the film. Notice there's a truck just outside the building that has the Feast logo on it, confirming this building is in fact a Feast facility, and Peter Parker is inside it. And notice the way the other cars and the Daily Bugle van are parked. It looks exactly the same as this scene, isn't it? So I can confirm not only Green Goblin, but Sandman and Electro will be here attacking this Feast facility. What remains to be seen is whether or not the rest of the villains will join them in this attack or not. Peter then steals this mystical box from Strange, and Strange tries to stop him. Strange literally opens two portals and turns Peter's web against himself. Well, the web was supposed to attach to a building, but Strange forced it back to Peter's own leg. I like this constant pattern of Strange and Wong, where they use portals to give someone a taste of their own medicine. Strange then brings Peter to the ground, and immediately separates his body from his astral form. Peter then tells Doctor Strange there has to be another way, but Strange says there isn't. So Peter is giving his all in order to keep the villains from dying. But Strange isn't giving him any options. We see Marisa Tomei, aka Aunt May, running, and she looks scared for her life. Or because we know how she is, so maybe she's trying to save someone's life here by sacrificing her own. But notice in the background, we can see flashes of blue and red. And outside the Feast facility, we've seen plenty of NYPD cars. This confirms that Aunt May is also inside this building. And as Peter couldn't stop this bomb from going off, so I suspect Aunt May survived the blast. We then see Tom's Peter swinging through the scaffolding, and Electro is following him. Now a lot of people are speculating that this is in fact Andrew Garfield or Tobey Maguire's Peter, not Tom Holland's, solely because the eyes appear a lot bigger here. But I think this is still Tom Holland, because if you replace a CGI character for a trailer, you'd replace the whole model. You wouldn't leave pieces behind. The reason it looks a bit odd in this angle is because of the motion blur, I believe. And as I'm showing you the highest resolution of the trailer possible, take a look at this image and ask yourself whether you see the integrated suit here or not. The answer should be an easy yes. Then we officially get our first ever look at MCU's Electro in his full form. Notice he first appears with his yellow lightning, and in the very next frame it's blue. So I think it's a culmination of two. And I just love the way he totally transforms into electricity, making his body almost invisible to the naked eye. And boy, when he appears in his actual form, it looks insane. 
and you have to love the way the VFX team managed to give him a mask made of pure lightning instead of cloth. This not only aligns with his comic accurate look, but also provides him with a modern style. I knew they could pull off comic accurate Electro the moment they pulled off comic accurate Mysterio. That was way tougher. Jamie Foxx then retains his human form even when he transforms into Electro. Even though I loved his visuals in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, but I take this any day over that one. Notice how he even has a core in the center of his suit, almost like an arc reactor, distributing energy wherever necessary. And as I said, when he goes full Electro, his body becomes invisible. It happens again as he prepares to shoot a lightning bolt. Now this is what surprises me. The trailer makes it seem as if Electro is fighting Doc Ock here, and I'm still wondering what that's about. Could we see some of the villains turning good at the last moment and fighting among themselves? I mean, Doc Ock never really died as a monster, he sacrificed himself. So could it be a hero again? Now in the next shot, we see a CGI model of Thomas Peters still holding the mystical box. Um, please ignore the quality of the CGI here. Trust me, it's gonna improve by the time the movie releases. But notice something crucial here. If Tom is standing here with the most important mystical box in his hand, then who is Electro fighting in the background? Hold that thought, I'll talk about it. Then we hear the much anticipated voice of Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin. Peter, you're struggling to have everything you want. With these few words in the trailer, Willem Dafoe makes his debut in the MCU, one of the greatest actors of our time, of any time really. We then get a close-up shot of Green Goblin who is carrying a pumpkin bomb and is on his glider. Judging by the smoke in the background, this is probably from the bridge scene where Goblin emerges for the first time. As I said, at the beginning, Willem Dafoe will don his classic suit along with the helmet. But as the movie progresses, he's gonna make some changes to his outfit. Precisely this look. Towards the end of the film, Goblin should look like this. No helmet, in control of six drones, and wearing borrowed goggles from Dr. Octopus. I know this version of Goblin is receiving some negative reviews, but I honestly loved it. Goblin looks young and more badass. In the next shot, we again see the outside of the Feast building. But notice this ad by the bus stop that has the same poster as we've seen in the construction site. Apparently, the government is promoting the remodeling of the Statue of Liberty. Now, after figuring out so many clues and details around Feast facility, and specifically this building, I'm afraid Happy might be looking at Aunt May's body here and doesn't know how to react. If that happens, there's gonna be a lot of teary eyes in the theaters. Cut back to the Statue of Liberty for the final act of the trailer. Here we see the same mystical rings that appeared when Doctor Strange's spell malfunctioned. So this could be the entry point or the portal through which heroes and foes from other universes will appear here. Notice the scale of the rings as it spreads across the city and keeps getting bigger. We then see a trio of villains, Electro, Sandman, and Lizard going against Thomas Peter. Lizard, of course, keeps his original look from Andrew Gerfield's universe. He even breaks some pieces of scaffolding while preparing to fight the final battle. Tom then makes his superhero landing and boy, I'm praying so so much so that Toby and Andrew appear behind him like this. Although I wouldn't mind if Toby stands in the middle considering he's the OG. Then we see Tom's Peter at his lowest. He gives up even before trying that he cannot save everyone. It's practically impossible for him. I mean, come on, it's a 1v6 for God's sake, which hopefully will be 3v6 on December 16th. Now, this is surely one of the most talked about scenes ever since the trailer got released. Apparently, Sony Brazil on Twitter uploaded this scene with an extended shot where Lizard mysteriously gets punched by thin air. And even if I talk about the main trailer, who is Electro and Lizard aiming here? I don't see anyone aiming for Tom's Peter here other than Sandman. So Sony surely edited out Toby and Andrew from this scene. And I really appreciate them doing this because we can be selfish and ask for everything to be revealed in the trailer. I mean, think about the general audience for a second. Well, the majority, by the way, some of them even go to theaters without watching trailers. Imagine the happiness they're gonna experience once they see their childhood hero teaming up with the current one and passing on the baton. But if you're like me, hang tight. We're gonna see them in the movie, okay? Now the penultimate scene of the trailer literally gave me chills. It took me back to when I watched The Amazing Spider-Man 2 in theaters. But just as MJ was about to fall, we see this thing in the background which many are claiming are the hands of Andrew Garfield. And Sony forgot to edit them out. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about this, lads. Uh, let me know your thoughts about this. I, I know they're both 100% in it, but I don't think Sony would make a blunder like this. Now the way Tom dropped everything and just went after MJ has been shot the exact same way as Andrew Garfield's. But unlike Andrew, Tom isn't shooting any web to catch MJ. He's just trying to reach her, which is a bit surprising. So his web shooters must have got damaged during the final battle. And if you ask for my theory, I'd say Tom probably won't be able to catch MJ, but Andrew will. Andrew will because after Gwen died, he must have thought of a thousand different ways he could have saved her, but he didn't apply those techniques in time. Perhaps Gwen's death helped Andrew become a better Spider-Man in his universe. He'll get his redemption act, even though he couldn't save the love of his life, but he will save someone else's. And 
would absolutely love if Toby comes to rescue Ned from falling, saving Tom's best friend, which Toby couldn't do in his universe. So if Tony really pulls this off, boy, I'm gonna cry in the theater itself. Now, the last scene in the trailer shows Doctor Strange completely losing control. His magical powers are mostly depicted as orange, but if you notice closely, it's getting overshadowed by the color purple, and purple represents dark magic in the MCU. So the multiverse is really shattering down, and Strange isn't able to do anything. The only way he can save his ass is if other heroes step in and help him stop this chaos. Now, one last detail before I end this video. Notice how Sony deliberately started the trailer by showing Tom Holland on a scaffolding with a blue screen behind him in the same angle as the leaked video of Andrew. Marvel and Sony know we have watched the leaked video of Andrew Garfield. I mean, it was discussed on national television. So by opening the trailer with the shot of Tom Holland, they're telling us T and A are in this movie without actually telling us anything. We gotta read between the lines, lads. Sony has actually given us enough, and I'm pretty happy about it. And that would be my breakdown of the second trailer of Spider-Man No Way Home. If you like this video, then please give me a thumbs up, grab the subscribe button, and turn notifications on. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter to talk to me personally. Till then, I'm Kevin Hart, and I'll see you lads in the next one. Out, am I? What's your name again? Dr. Otto Octavia. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Um, I'm Spider-Man then.